I uh, <clears throat> am a professor at Regent University now, but for many years I headed uh, an ecumenical group called North American Renewal Service Committee, and I chaired several big congresses on the Holy Spirit in New Orleans, 1987. Did any of you go there? That was a mighty meeting. And then uh, others in um, Orlando, Florida, Indianapolis, Indiana, and finally uh, in St. Louis in the year 2000. So I uh, worked with many, many wonderful Catholic brothers and sisters, went to, the, to Rome several times, met two popes. I met Pope Francis when he was um, the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires and uh, a bunch of charismatic leaders, including Kevin Renahan. He said, please pray for us. And being charismatics, we just ganged around and prayed for him. <laughs> and uh, when he was elected Pope, I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> it was amazing to me that the Lord chose this man at this time, and we thank God for him. Now, they asked me to talk about the history of the renewal. Now, I teach this class uh, usually 20 hours a week, so I'm not going to do 20 hours. I'm going to just take a part of it, and I'll spend more time on the Catholic renewal, but I, I, I'll hop, skip, and jump through some earlier parts, if that's okay with you. If any of you want this PowerPoint, I'll be glad to let you make a copy for yourself. Now, I, uh, in, in my books, I talk about before World War II, when the only people who were being baptized in the Spirit publicly were Pentecostals, and they were looked down on. I was raised in a Pentecostal preacher's home, and they called us everything, including holy rollers. That was what I grew up, and it was terrible. But um, through even persecution and those dark days, there was a, a, a marvelous truth there that God was going to honor in a wonderful way that we never dreamed. I, I was born near here in Hopewell, Virginia, grew up at Suffolk. Never could have dreamed that I would be dean of a great university that Pat Robertson founded, that spirit filled. And um, so uh, times have changed a lot, but uh, I'll just hop, skip, and jump. Is that all right? And we'll have questions later. Um, after World War II is when the big change took place. In the American public, people began to see things that they never dreamed they would see. There were rapid growth of Pentecostal churches in all the cities of this country. Uh, suddenly people saw not just poor, ignorant people, but folks who had businessmen, educated people, nice churches, and they rose into, many into the middle class, no longer just poor, and um, they, what really brought this to the attention of the American people were the healing crusades. After World War II, Billy Graham, Billy Graham was a great evangelist, but it was Oral Roberts mainly, and uh, others who held great healing crusades and went on television. And that brought the idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit right into the living rooms of the American people. I'll never forget uh, my father saying that the Catholic bishops in uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, and New York City are worried because so many Catholics are watching Oral Roberts and they love him and they send him money. And so that got the bishops all concerned, but it showed that there was a great attraction to the healing ministry and of being filled with the Spirit. Uh, then some of these, uh, I'll show you pictures in a second. Uh, Tommy Higgs, Oral Roberts, R William Branham, some of you may remember some of those. He's a kind of a mystic guy from Indiana, William Branham, that kind of started the post-World War II healing crusades. Um, here's Oral Roberts under his big tent. I knew him, he knew our family. My dad was his bishop for many, many years. And uh, he broke the ground in the American public. Um, then you have full gospel businessmen, Demon Shikarian, who uh, opened up the door for millions of businessmen and women to go to hotels and be baptized in spirit. David Duplessis became, I have pictures of them, 
a kind of ecumenist, a face for Pentecostalism all over the world. He went to Vatican II. There were a lot of stereotypes that broke down that people were une uneducated, poor, and the, the world's largest church suddenly came into the consciousness of people. Yonggi Cho had 800,000 members in Seoul, Korea. So it showed there was a mass appeal to people who are filled with the Spirit. Here's Demon Shikarian, full gospel. You, any of you meet him or were in meetings with him? He was a great layman. David, David Duplessis, he became the face of Pentecostalism. You met him. Um, I was worked with him a lot over the years. Um, now is this thing will work. Help me, Jesus. There it goes. Now, when I teach, I talk about two people who were baptized in the Spirit and were put out of their churches. Uh, usually, in the earlier days, if you spoke with tongues, you had a one-way ticket out of the church. They gave you the left foot of fellowship, if you please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Richard Winkler, Episcopalian, Gerald Durstein, a Mennonite. Uh, these were earlier on before the charismatic movement started. Harold Bredesen, who led Pat Robertson into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was a Lutheran um, and from the Dutch Reformed Church later. But the one who really um, broke the ground, this is Gerald Durstein, a Mennonite who was put out of the church because of his Pentecostal experience. But the man who broke the ground was Dennis Bennett and his wife, Rita. You see them there. We have all their papers at Regent University. They donated all his records. So we have students doing doctoral PhD research. And uh, you're welcome to come over sometime and see what we have. Now, Dennis was the very opposite of the Holy Roller, if you please. Episcopalian, born in England, educated the Chicago School of Divinity, urbane, sophisticated, you know. Um, but he saw people in his church that did weird things. They brought their Bibles to church, and they sat on the front row, and they said weird things like hallelujah and praise the Lord. It's, it bothered him. And even more, they paid their tithes and volunteered to do anything. These are strange Episcopalians. So, so he began to search, who, who are these people? He found out they were Methodists and Episcopalians who had been baptized in spirit. They told him about speaking with tongues. He was dubious at first, but then he began to read the Bible. He, he was amazed. he never seen the Holy Spirit so many times. He read the Book of Common Prayer. And everything where he looked, he saw the Holy Spirit. And he began to hunger to receive the baptism in the Spirit. And the day came at 9 o'clock in the morning. In his book, he calls it 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, I wonder if someone could read that for me. It has a good, loud voice. Would you do it? I suppose I must have prayed out loud for about 20 minutes. At least it seemed to be a long time. I was just about to give up when a very strange thing happened. My tongue tripped, just as I might when you are trying to recite it from Scripture. And I began to speak in a new language. Right away, I recognized several things. First, it wasn't some kind of psychological trick or compulsion. There was nothing compulsive about it. It was a new language, not some kind of baby talk. It had grammar and syntax, it had inflection and expression, and it was rather beautiful. Wow, what a nicely educated testimony. <laughs> University of Chicago Divinity graduate. When I grew up in our church, you just said, I got the Holy Ghost last night, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at the way he described it. It was a beautiful thing. It should be beautiful. So uh, here's the first one to make a movement in the Protestant churches, Dennis Bennett. He, was, he left his church. People didn't accept him. He went to Seattle and had a great ministry there. He told me that for 20 years, they had 2,000 people every Sunday in that church. They were going to close the church before he came, 2,000 people a week. And he said, we averaged 20 people baptized in the Holy Spirit every week. For 20 years in Seattle. It became another Azusa Street for Lutherans and Methodists and Baptists, and a lot of Catholics went up there. 
and they were attracted also. Nuns went up there and priests, and it was amazing that like a magnet they were drawn to Seattle. And that sort of began what we call then the Neo-Pentecostal movement, the New Pentecostals, who were in the mainline churches. And he was able to stay in the church until the day he died. It then quickly moved into the Presbyterian Church, Brick Bradford, Methodist, Tommy Tyson, some of you may have heard Tommy, uh, James Brown, a Presbyterian. I preached for most of these people, Larry Christensen, Lutheran, um, Pat Robertson, a Baptist, uh, right here in Norfolk. And later on, he started a 700 Club, CBN, and uh, so he's been a, a strong, Howard Conasser, a Baptist in Texas. Here's Brick Bradford, he's from Oklahoma City, he's still living, and he was a strong leader among Presbyterians and Christensen, a Lutheran, Pat Roberts, a Southern Baptist, and this is Pat's first studio in Portsmouth. A broken down, windows broken out, old building that was the seed bed for CBN with a worldwide ministry now. And there he is teaching in the early days. I was there in, in that old studio many years ago when I was a kid uh, watching that program. Now, these, uh, these, we're still talking about Protestants. They were a little different from the early Pentecostals. They, um, they believed that tongues were somehow tied into the baptism of the Holy Spirit like the Pentecostals did. Howard Irving, especially a Baptist. Rod Williams, who came to Regent, said that tongues was the primary evidence, not the initial, but the primary evidence. And uh, he said, Dennis said, tongues like a, a pair of shoes, tongues is part of the package. You know, you buy a shoe and the tongue comes with it. Um, but the, these uh, new, new Pentecostals uh, said tongues could come later. The Pentecostals were scandalized when some folks smoked cigarettes and spoke in tongues and drank wine because we couldn't do that. You could, but we couldn't. <laughs> but uh, anyway, those were those early days. As Rod Williams, he came here and established School of Divinity at Regent University, a great, a great theologian. His book, Renewal Theology, is uh, the first systematic charismatic theology ever written. Um, then you had a lot of other things happening. Dave Wilkerson crossing the switchblade, Chuck Smith, coffee houses, communes, Bible schools, vineyard, all these things are happening among the youth culture. We thought that drugs had destroyed a whole generation of young people and suddenly the Holy Spirit is being poured out and these druggies flock to the churches and are, are born again and are filled with the Holy Spirit, and delivered from drugs. Uh, nothing else. All the medicine and doctors couldn't do a thing, but uh, Dave Brooks and called the baptism in the Holy Spirit the 30-second cure. In 30 seconds, you can be delivered from all those drugs. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> amen. So a lot of people were delivered. It was a miraculous thing to see hundreds of thousands of young people saved out of the drug culture, but it wasn't just an intellectual gospel, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that broke through to that generation. Here's Chuck Smith baptized 15,000 young people, they call them Jesus people, in the Pacific Ocean. Those are great days. Um, now, the Catholic charismatic movement, I say Catholic Pentecostalism at first, they use the word Pentecostal. We are the Catholic Pentecostals, and we like that. Um, then later on, they adopted, about 1965, they adopted the word charismatic. Um, now, to me, I was shocked to know that Episcopalians and Baptists and Methodists could be filled with the Spirit. That was hard for me to take. I didn't think it would ever come to the Roman Catholic Church. This was the biggest surprise of all, because I grew up quite anti-Catholic, by the way. I was more afraid of Catholics than I was communists or rattlesnakes. <laughs> That's what I like to say sometimes. Uh, I read books, and uh, 
and yet uh, knew God could do anything. Uh, I thought that was something he probably couldn't do, but anyway. Um, but there was a background. You see, Vatican II came, but there was about a century where Catholic theologians were studying the Holy Spirit. In Germany, Johann Muller and Matthias Schieben were writing books. They call it revalorizing the charisms. In other words, in the Western church for centuries, the cessation idea had been in place. The gifts of the Spirit died with the apostles. Once the church was established, you don't need miracles, signs, and wonders anymore. And um, although there were a lot of Catholics had miracles over the centuries, it was generally thought that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the age of the apostles. But these men were saying in Germany that the gifts are still with us. They have not ceased. And that was a breakthrough. And Germans are the most negative theologians in the world. And yet these men are the ones who paved the way for the renewal in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and then this is the wonderful story. You, you, how many of you have heard of Elena Guerra? Some of you have not. Elena Guerra, uh, the little nun from Italy. They say Guerra. Uh, the scholars, Italians. Well, guerra. I've heard it a lot of different ways. In Spanish, it's guerra, but this is Italian. Is it still guerra or guerra? I've heard them say guerra. That's what I've heard. But anyway, who cares? Uh, you can see what it's spelled like. Anyway, uh, uh, just a little review. We have a brother from Topeka, Kansas here. He's written a book on the first Pentecost there in 1901 when a little holiness girl by the name of Agnes Osmond in a Bible school in Topeka, uh, they discovered that tongues is what happened when you're baptized in spirit. And they began to pray for it the first day of the 20th century. And she began to speak the Chinese language. Uh, and that's where it all started in the 20th century so that's 1901. And by the way, there's a Catholic church on that very spot, as you know, and I've preached there before. I've been told that over 5,000 Catholics were filled with the Holy Spirit in that one prayer group on the very spot where the Pentecostal movement was born. And I once preached there to 1,000 Catholics and taught all week long, and we had 120 Catholics who spoke with tongues. That's a good Pentecostal number. And uh, we held a Pentecost Sunday service in the most pure heart of Mary Catholic Church, jammed it out with a 1,000 people without any advertising except radio. So that was uh, where it all began, 1901. Now, in, 19, in 1897, uh, just before that, Elena Guerra uh, wrote a letter. I, I thought I had her picture. I don't have To Pope Louis, uh, Leo III. She took a devotion to the Holy Spirit, and she became a nun. She was pained that she didn't hear hardly anything about the Holy Spirit in the church. So she wanted to write a letter to the Pope, and her sister said, don't do that. He'll never read it. She did anyway. Leo XIII not only read it, what she asked for was a novena to the Holy Spirit every year between Ascension and Pentecost. And he accepted that and declared for the whole Catholic world, every Catholic prays nine days, a cycle of prayer to the Holy Spirit. And uh, he did this encyclical on the Holy Spirit in 1897. And in the turn of the century, he knelt in, the, in, the, in St. Peter's and dedicated the 20th century to the Holy Spirit. So I wrote a book called The Century, of the Holy Spirit. I don't have one with me, but it's a big, thick book that's being used in colleges, seminary. You got, anybody else got one? It's a, it's a good book, by the way. <laughs> Just look it up. Cent Vincent Sign, Century of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's used all over the world in many languages. So um, it seems that the Spirit was moving in the Protestant world and the Catholic world at about, there you go, hold it up. 
this is called Century of the Holy Spirit. I was asked to write this book, and now it's in Polish and Spanish and Portuguese. and who I don't know what else, but you can order it on Amazon.com. I have all these stories and pictures in it. Okay, so this is the background, part of the background of the Catholic renewal. So in Germany, the theologians are saying the gifts are still part of the church, and here's this little nun who became a saint, by the way, Blessed Elena Guerra, or Guerra. Um, and uh, she, she was a pioneer, a spiritual pioneer for the Catholic Church. Um, there were other movements in the Catholic Church. Okay, there were other things happening in the Catholic Church. I'll go very quickly. There was a lay movement starting in 1900. Lay people were, were, were met hatched, matched, and dispatched by the church. I mean, that's it. They're born, married, and buried. They say hatched, matched, and dispatched. And the priest did just about everything, but there was a, a movement to bring lay people into the ministry of the church, starting in Spain. Then you have biblical studies, a biblical movement. Uh, over the centuries, Protestants had been great Bible readers, but Catholics were not, did not read the Bible as much as Protestants. And suddenly, uh, the Catholics are publishing the Bible in the languages of the people and encouraging Catholics to read the Bible, even giving you thousands of years out of purgatory. So much for every chapter and every book. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, so that was an encouraging thing because the Bible says the interest of that word brings light. And I, th I, I don't think you could have had a charismatic renewal without the first charismatic Catholics I saw brought, carried great big Jerusalem Bibles all over the place under their arms. You couldn't hide it. They weighed 10 pounds. Uh, so biblical movement preceded the charismatic renewal. Uh, it was a very important movement. Uh, the ecumenical movement started in 1910 uh, among Protestants and began to bring people from different churches to meet together, mainly to send missionaries throughout the world. Uh, you had Yves Conger, a Frenchman, theologian, who wrote a book, Chrétien Desunis, Disunited Christians, where he said that outside the Catholic Church there were Christians who didn't have everything that the Catholics had, but they, they knew the Lord, and they should be recognized as ecclesial communities. So there was a beginning to recognize Christians outside the Roman Catholic Church. Um, then some of you would know this, the Cursillo movement. Did any of you go, go through Cursillo? Oh, my gracious. <laughs> Almost all of you. This starts in 1949. It's Spanish. Cursillo means a short crash course. What they were saying that millions of Catholics have been sacramentalized but not evangelized. They knew all the doctrines and they were faithful to the church, had the sacraments, but they never really met Jesus in a personal sort of way. And so this was a crash course for Catholics to just learn what it means to be a Christian. Father Con uh, Mason said something in region that really caught fire the other day. He said, we've got to be one. He said, in the rest of the world where they attack Christian churches, he said, it doesn't make any difference whether you're Catholic or Protestant to the enemies of the church. We're all one. We're all Christians already, as far as they're concerned. So we get shot and burned up together equally. Um, so Cursillo was a great evangelizing tool to bring Catholics into a personal Born again, if you please, experience with Jesus, which was very crucial for the charismatic renewal. Then Vatican II came, and Vatican II was a revolution in the Catholic Church. Um, four years, three years, 1962 to 65 in Rome, and all the bishops came together, Pope John XXIII, who was just canonized last week. Did you see that? And he um, called for Vatican II. There had not been a council since 1870. 
And they thought he was an old man that just wouldn't rock the boat, but he did he ever rock the boat. He called all the bishops together, and he told every Catholic in the world to pray this prayer. Lord, renew your wonders in this our day as by a new Pentecost. Every Catholic in the world was supposed to pray that every day for three years. As by a new Pentecost. And you know what? God answers prayer. Isn't that wonderful? When people pray, the Lord hears. And so, um, and then he said, Vatican II is to open the windows and let a fresh breath of air flow into the church. What's the word for spirit in the Old Testament? Ruah, wind. So he was saying, let the Holy Spirit blow into the church. And uh, so during the uh, Vatican Council, Cardinal Sunins from Belgium led the charge for renewal in the church. Now, he became a charismatic leader. I knew him, worked with him, wonderful man of God. Um, and when in the Vatican Council, some of the South American bishops wanted to pass a resolution that the gifts had ceased, they wanted to reaffirm that old teaching, he got him and said, no. The charism, the gifts of the Spirit are still in the church. And they passed in the Constitution of the Church, the Catholic Church of Vatican II said, the church is a charismatic institution and made up of the gifts of the Spirit and gifted people. And so that passed. And the, get this, the charismatic renewal was, was approved in advance <laughs> by the bishops. That's backwards. Usually the Lord moves and then the church wakes up. This time they didn't know it, but 65, you know, is 67 is when it starts, you know. So two years before the charismatic renewal started, it was all legally approved in Vatican II. Isn't that marvelous? Amen. Is the Lord good or is he not? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I may start preaching. I'm an old Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> I just thank God that he's, this day has dawned. And Cardinal Sunnis became later the um, advisor to the popes for the renewal. I've got his picture. Let me see if I can get it up real quick. Oh, that's, that's later on. Let's talk about the um, Duquesne weekend. Now, I know you've all heard this story, so I'll try to make it fast. Is that all right? Because uh, I knew these people very well. Um, 1967, a retreat of graduate students at Duquesne University, Duquesne, founded by the Holy Ghost Fathers of all things. Two professors, Bill Story and Ralph Kiefer, were reading Crossing the Switchblade by David Wilkerson. And they began to study and find out that all over the world there's a great move of God called Pentecostal movement. And um, it was booming and growing more than anything else in the world. And they thought the Catholic Church needs to get on board. And so they began to look around Pittsburgh to try to find someone who had this baptism in spirit. They checked an Episcopal church and they finally found a little Presbyterian prayer group near Pittsburgh led by a lady by the name of Flo Dodge. I, I met her later, later. These two professors in the university went to this little prayer meeting by these little old ladies. And they were shocked. They said, we saw the whole New Testament exegeted before our very eyes. People were healed. They spoke in tongues, interpreted. They prophesied, laid hands on people. They said, we were seeing the New Testament before our very eyes. They were shocked. And they went back and told their students and said, something's going on. And they decided to have a retreat in um, the Ark and the Dove. It's a Catholic retreat house north of Pittsburgh. About 30 or 40 students over the weekend, which is the beginning of the Catholic charismatic renewal. These students did homework. They read The Cross and the Swiss Blade, uh, John Sherrill's book, They Speak with Other Tongues, and the first four chapters of Acts. Now, that's good homework. 
And so this revival starts in a homework assignment, just like in Topeka when the first Pentecost fell in a school, by the way. And so they met, and uh, they were having a good time downstairs. They had a birthday party for a prof. And, but these students, after reading this, got so hungry to be filled with the Spirit they went upstairs one after another to the uh, chapel and knelt before the Blessed Sacrament in prayer. And as they prayed, suddenly people downstairs heard strange things like, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! And they would fall on the floor, thump, and slain in the spirit. One boy, David Mangan, rolled across the floor, the first Catholic holy roller, if you please. <laughs> I met these people later. They're wonderful young people. They were just young kids, graduate students in college. And that night, heaven descended. And um, Patty Gallagher was the, there the first time. And she was just a young girl, not married. She married Mans, uh, Mansfield guy later in, from New Orleans. And she wrote about what happened. And I'd like for my friend to read this. That night, the Lord brought the whole group into the chapel. I found my prayers pouring forth that the others might know him. know him too. My former shyness about praying aloud was completely gone as the Holy Spirit spoke through me. The professors then laid hands on some of the students, but most of us received the baptism of the Holy Spirit while kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament in prayer. Some of us started speaking in tongues. Others received gifts of discernment, prophecy, and wisdom. But the most important gift was the fruit of love, which bound the whole community together. In the Lord's Spirit, we found a unity we had long tried to achieve on our own. Isn't that marvelous that unity is what came out of that? It, it drew their hearts together. And that's what has been one of the most beautiful things about the renewal. It brought people from all churches, all backgrounds together in a marvelous grassroots unity that the churches never were able to do on their own. It was just the Holy Spirit flowing across all these lines. And um, I think that was just a marvelous testimony from Patty Gallagher. You got that? Thank you. So this is the first Catholic Charismatic prayer meeting in a university setting. And it spread from there to Notre Dame University, uh, to uh, University of Michigan, and then all over the United States. The leaders in that early movement, Notre Dame is Kevin Ranahan. Did any of you know Kevin? Great, wonderful man of God. Ralph Martin, one of the early Catholic leaders. Steve Clark, and then Kieran McDonald. He was a great, world-renowned Catholic theologian who was appointed to be the theological advisor to the Pope for the Charismatic Renewal, and I worked with him. He's the one who invited me to Notre Dame in 1972, and I'd never seen a walking, talking Catholic Charismatic in my life. I was kind of afraid, and so I was going to respond to a paper there. And um, let me just, it's hard for me to just tell you this, what happened. Now, I'm an old Pentecostal. My dad was a Pentecostal bishop. And, um, but I had written a history of the movement, which the Catholics had begun buying. In fact, when I went to Rome, they had copied my book and Xerox and sent all the bishops in Europe. My book <laughs> were read by all the bishops in Europe my soul and body. And uh, so I was invited because of that book to go to this great charismatic conference in 72. Now, they had only had 4,000 a year before. That was a pretty good number. This year, they had 12,000. It was amazing. how The, the next year, they had 33,000. That's how it was booming in those days. And I went there, and the first night I registered, and they said, there's a little prayer meeting for early arrivals over in the basketball coliseum. I expected two, 300 people, so I couldn't wait. I ran 
threw my luggage on the bed in the dorm and ran across campus to see my first Catholic meeting. Now, I'd been taught to be careful about those Catholics. <laughs> so I went up and sat as far away as I could. When I walked in, there were 8,000 people already there. 8,000 early arrivals. And I'd heard they were the quiet Pentecostals. <laughs> And so I was up there watching and saying, Lord, bless them. And uh, then all of a sudden, they, they had a guitar and a tambourine and a flute. That's all they had, just three instruments. They started singing our songs, Pentecostal songs, without our permission. <laughs> and I was shocked. These Catholics are singing our song, they sang Amazing Grace. And as they sang, they said, let's just praise the Lord. And all of a sudden, 16,000 hands went up. Nuns, backpackers, mostly young people, priests, bishops, all kinds. And then a great sound started very softly. It got louder and louder in a four-part chord that filled the Colosseum. They were singing in tongues, singing in the Spirit. I never heard it like that in my life. And I grew up in the movement. And as they sang, it seemed like the Holy Spirit fell on top of me and knocked me out. I started crying. You know, when the Spirit moves, I never have a handkerchief. <laughs> so I was crying. I couldn't breathe. I had to run to a restroom and blow my nose. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Vincent Sonnen, whether you like it or not, I'm doing this. This is my work. And I, not only that, you are going to contribute to this movement. The Lord told me I'm going to have a part in this. I said, no, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> They'll kick me out of the church. <laughs> you know? But I said, Lord, this is so marvelous. I'll do anything you ask me to do. My life was turned upside down that week when I saw these wonderful men and women of God Filled with the same Holy Ghost that we had. That's not a Protestant Holy Ghost and a Catholic Holy Ghost. One Holy Spirit. Amen. And he works the same way everywhere. He's not bound by anybody or anything. So uh, the Lord said, you go back and tell your people. I said, but Lord, that'll be the end of my career. You know us, Lord. We fight everything that moves, especially if it moves faster than we do, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I came back. I went to Rome in dialogue with the great theologians, came back to my church. We had a general conference where they elect officials in Roanoke, Virginia. I've been out of the country. I was not a politician, church politician, that is, I, although I'm Irish, and they make the best church politicians in the world. I guess you know that. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, when I got back, they asked me to, I'd written a history of the church, and they asked me to have five minutes to present my book, The History of Pentecostal Holiness Church. And the Lord said, talk up two and a half minutes about your book and two and a half minutes about Notre Dame and about, I'd just been to Rome, met cardinals singing Amazing Grace. And I said, that's the end of my career, Lord, but I'll do any, I told you I'd do anything you asked me to do. So I got up in front of about three or 4,000 people, talked about my book, and then I said, I've just come back from Rome, and I want to tell you folks, God is moving in the Catholic Church. And you know what? A spirit of prophecy came on me, and I said, it's not just because you have the word Pentecostal outside on your church door. What counts is the Holy Spirit inside the church and I said, we need to pray for these Catholics. We need to pray for our own church, I said. And they stood up, and for about five minutes, they clapped and shouted and praised the Lord and wept. Two days later, I got elected general secretary of the whole denomination. <laughs> I can't explain that. And I said, Lord, I'm going to bear witness everywhere I go to what I've seen. I was invited to churches all over the nation, all kinds, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalian, Catholics. I spoke in many Catholic churches, went to Rome in dialogue, and I 
kept telling the same story. The Spirit of God is moving in all churches. The Lord is changing the world. This charismatic movement is going to turn the church upside down. And I saw revivals break out all over wherever I went. I took my guitar. Believe it or not, I taught these Pentecostals Catholic charismatic songs. <laughs> Without your permission, I did it. And they loved it. So um, here was this great move of God in the Catholic Church that caught us all by surprise. I was in St. Peter's in 1975 when I was in, in, invited to be um, an observer when there was an international meeting of Catholic Charismatics, 10,000 in Rome. And there was a big question mark about the Pope. Will he approve it or not? See, in the early history of the movement, heads of churches, when they said no to the Pentecostal renewal, it died in those churches. When they said yes, those churches took off and grew. And if the Pope said no, that's it. It would be over with. Uh, and a lot of people came to hear John Paul VI and see what he would say. So I was there, sitting in the choir. They had said no prophecies, no dancing in the spirit. That's what they said. The dean said that. But you know what? Before that meeting was over, they were prophesying all over the place and dancing before the Lord right in front of the Pope himself. <laughs> and when he spoke, Cardinal Sunnis was there. John Paul VI said these words. I'll never forget it. He said, how fortunate for the church that there's a generation of young people who shout out the praises of the God of Pentecost. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said that. And he said, if so, why not support it? And he said, perhaps this is a chance for the church and the world. That was it. No bishop could ever oppose the movement again. Not officially. And that opened the door for the movement to grow and spread all over the earth into the greatest uh, renewal movement in the history of the Catholic Church. There today, listen, 200 million Catholic Charismatics in the world. Did you know that? 200 million. It's not that much in the U.S. like it used to be, but in, in South America, India, Asia, Philippines, mass movements of the Spirit. You go into any church in Mexico and you think you're in a charismatic conference. And so this has permeated the Catholic world not only that, the Protestant world, there's hardly any Protestant church outside the United States that's not charismatic today. So um, that is the uh, greatest mass movement that's happened in Christianity in the last thousand years. And by the way, Larry Christensen just was talking with me and he said, this is the first renewal that touched every church in Christendom in every nation of the world. Other awakenings just touch part of the church. Just a few denominations maybe. We call them great awakenings. This is the greatest one. It touched every church in the world. And none more strongly than the Roman Catholic Church. In those early days it was miraculous to see what was happening. Um, I remember care if I give some person what time is it now? Some personal stories. 25 after four, okay. I, I held a revival in Galveston, Texas, sponsored by a Pentecostal church and a Catholic church. Can you believe it? And we were both, we had to move into a Sims of God church because the crowds were so big. And um, there was a lady whose brother was a priest. And she wanted him to come. She wanted him to be filled with the Spirit, but he didn't like it at all. So she said, well, you have dinner with us before service tonight and meet him. I said, yeah. So we had dinner, and this priest said to me, I don't believe in any of this. This is a lot of hokum. I'm here just because my sister asked me to come, so don't try to bother me. I said, okay, I won't say anymore. So when the service started, 
We had great worship and singing and praise. Hands were up all over the place. And then I called for people that wanted prayer to come up to the front. So about 50 people lined up, and I was praying for them one after another. When I got to this priest, I said, would you like to pray, me to pray for you? He said, if it'll make you feel good. I said, well, he really would. <laughs> he said, I don't believe in this. So I just touched the top of his head. All of a sudden, his eyes glazed over, and he started falling forward right into me. I didn't push him. I had to hold him up to keep from falling on the floor. And it was, it was just a Holy Ghost making a believer out of him. God can do that. And man, when it was up with, he said, what in the world hit me? I said, that's that Holy Ghost that you don't like. <laughs> but that was a wonderful time to see things like that, like that happening. I don't know how many people came to me at Steubenville and other places and said, um, uh, Father, Son, I won't want you to pray for me. <laughs> I said, I'm not a father. I'm married and have four children. <laughs> so I heard Catholic confessions over the years, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. Here's some of the great leaders of the Catholic Renewal. Kevin Ranahan, he was chairman of the great conference in Kansas City in 1977. Were any of you there? We often say that was the highlight of the whole movement. Uh, about 50,000 people came, and the spirit fell, remember, when Bob Mumford preached. For a half an hour, that stadium was roaring with people praising God. It sounded like the Super Bowl had just been won, and doves began to circle around that stadium while that was praise was going on. And the Lord just touched all of us. Half of them were Catholics, half were Protestants. And so we saw tremendous unity, grassroots unity in those days. And he was a great leader, Kevin Renahan. There's a group at, in Rome with Pope John Paul II, who I happened to meet later on. And so they met with Pope John Paul II. I met with a group. Uh, years later, there was a meeting of Catholic leaders in Assisi, of all places. And the French Pentecostals had loaned the Catholics a tent to seat 1,500 people. And I came as an observer, and we were there on top of the hill, and right down the hillside was the church where St. Francis is buried. And um, we just saw a great, great move of God there. And we went after that in buses to uh, Castel Gondolfo, the summer palace of the popes, we met John Paul II. I have a picture of me shaking his hand. And um, I looked in his eyes and I thought, here's one of the great men in all the history of the world. In Poland, from Poland, he faced down the communists. And because of him, I believe in prayer, the whole European communist system crashed. And this man is the one who led the fight in that great part of world history. So that's a group of leaders in Rome. And there's Cardinal Leon Joseph Sunins. He was a great man of God. Uh, I got him to speak in Oklahoma City in a Pentecost celebration. He flew all the way over. And um, he, uh, I heard him speak with tongues with my own ears. Um, my first Catholic communion, you wanna hear about that, anybody? <laughs> Which wasn't supposed to be. But uh, I was in a big meeting in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's where they had this great Word of God community. And uh, they had a service one night with a, with a mass and had the Eucharist. And I knew I couldn't go up there and take communion because I'm not a member of the Catholic Church. Although I longed to be part of everybody. I wanted, I wanted to be united. And I sat back there weeping. Lord, somehow make us one. And I was there, and a lady came and tapped me on the shoulder. She had the host. She broke it in two, said, Will you receive this as the body of our Lord? I said, I sure will, sister. And so um, I received it, probably illegally, but I felt like it was wonderful that the broken body of Jesus brought us together in that meeting there. And I told my Catholic friends, they started crying. 
He said, don't you know you're a Catholic now? I said, well, maybe not. <laughs> now, have you heard? Has he spoken here yet? Yes. What a saint. Um, when I was at Assisi, he spoke there. And I was leading the big Congress in St. Louis in 2000. I don't know whether any of you were there. And we were going to have about 20,000 people. And I wanted him to speak. And so I listened to his sermon. And I, after the sermon, I wanted to see him. I followed him out of the tent to a small tent. And this man sat there in a chair and meditated for 45 minutes after his sermon. I had to sit there and wait for him. What a saint he is. And when it finished, I invited him to come, and he did come to be with us in St. Louis. And the reason I was so interested was long before I knew who he was, there was a rumor that went all over this country that someone imported inside the Vatican close to the Pope who's been baptized in the Spirit. It was him. I didn't know it. And what he t told us was that he, the Kansas City Conference, remember that great conference, somebody bought four tickets for him and three other Catholic priests to fly to Kansas City to attend that conference. He was not sure what was going on. When he saw the praises of those people, his heart was strangely moved. He went from there to New Jersey. Um, Father... Um, I know it was just skipped out of my head. Jim Ferry. He was baptized in the Spirit, spoke in tongues in Jim Ferry's prayer group. Went back to Rome. And uh, three years later was made the papal preacher to the papal household. So here's this man filled with the Holy Ghost who preaches. The only person for 30 years who could preach to the Pope. And he's here. And he's been one of the great, great, great leaders of the renewal all over the world. You're fortunate to have him here. It's a marvelous thing to have him. Um, now, I'm going to do a little theology. What time is it now? 4.30? 4.34, okay. Okay. Um, the, there were some differences in some theological differences between the old Pentecostals and the Charismatics in the mainline churches. The older Pentecostals, the one I grew up in, we had been taught that speaking in tongues was the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That uh, you couldn't say you had it until you spoke with tongues. Uh, but soon, when Catholics and Lutherans and others Many of them said, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I didn't speak with tongues then. Most of them did later. Uh, in fact, the, the greatest tongue speakers I ever met were Catholic charismatic. Catholics love to sing in tongues and pray in tongues. And, you know, it's just a, it's been a marvelous manifestation among Catholics. But they call it the organic view that um, what was called uh, baptism of spirit is a release that when you're born again or baptized, you receive Father, Son, and Spirit. You can't receive part of the Trinity. You receive Father, Son, and Spirit at the time you are baptized or saved, whatever your church tradition is. But later on, if you're filled with the Spirit, they didn't even recognize the word baptism at first. Later on, the Catholic theologians said, yes, you can use the term baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that is a release of the Spirit that you already received in the sacraments. And that made it possible for the renewal to stay in the Catholic Church, be accepted on the highest levels. So we didn't let these little doctrinal things keep it. The big thing is to be filled with the Spirit, not what your theology of it is, is to be filled with God. Um, so this is something we deal with. There were great congresses. I don't have time to go into all of that. There were controversies. Uh, remember the shepherding controversy? That was a big thing that uh, swept through the movement for a while. Uh, Derek Prince, Bob Mumford, Don Basham, and others. Then the charismatic communities. One thing about Catholics, any new movement, you, you start communities. How many of you are part of a community? Uh, lots of you. I, I've been to a hallelujah community. Any hallelujahs here? There you are, yeah. 
I've been the Word of God. Any, there's a Word of Godder, and what are others? Glory to God, God. and what? New creation. creation. Yeah, the one at Notre Dame is um, people of praise. praise, Yes, Um, there were some people that felt that the um, the communities were too restrictive, that they were too set apart. And that they tried to control people's lives. I guess you remember hearing some of those things. And uh, so you, you really had two big movements going into Catholic renewal. One was the prayer group movement, where local churches would have prayer groups. And then you had the communities. And um, at one time, there were 5,000 prayer groups, Catholic prayer groups in the US, some of them extremely large. I've spoken many of them over the years. And the communities are still going, and they're still Catholic prayer groups. They're not as large as they used to be. But you know what? The Americans planted the seeds. And all over the world, there are hundreds and thousands and millions of Catholics who are filled with the Spirit and worship in the Spirit. So uh, don't worry about America. God's interested in the whole world and renewing the whole world and saving the whole world. So... um, There were some of the things we had to face in those days. There's the faith movement, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, E.W. Kenyon, prophetic movement, John Wimber, Paul Kane. Remember the exotic manifestations of Toronto, the Toronto blessing. There's some of the things that came along. Um, And I don't have time to go into all of those. Kenneth Copeland, I, I know most of these people, knew them. Uh, then you had what they called the third waivers. The first wave, they said, were the Protestant Pentecostals. Second wave were the Catholics and uh, liturgical churches. Third wave, Peter Wagner said, were evangelicals who are filled with the Spirit and practice the gifts, but they don't call themselves Pentecostals or Charismatics. So uh, Vineyard is a good case of that. And so... Um, this um, movement spread in evangelical churches now. I just uh, heard that, you yeah, over here, Robert Morris Gateway Church, Southern Baptist, filled with spirit. He had 50,000 Easter Sunday in his services, 50,000. The biggest church in America is Joel Osteen's church, and they have 40-some thousand every Sunday in all their services. So their mega churches that are just booming, not only here, but in all over the earth. I was in Nigeria a few years ago, and there's a church that um, has a camp meeting that holds one million people under roof. You have to drive a car to get to the platform. And they have a million people once a month for an all-night prayer meeting. And when they have the big annual meeting, they have 5 million people who attend in a big open-air place. So this has gone and exploded beyond anything anybody could ever imagine. I'm just writing right now a Wikipedia article for Reinhard Bonnke. You know who he is? Reinhard. I wish I'd brought some videos to show you, but he uh, held a meeting in 2000 and. Lagos, Nigeria, where a million six hundred thousand people came. Over one million people were converted in one service. Signed decision cards in one service. So all over the world, there's a mass move of people back to God. And um, you're you're part of that. You're some of you are pioneers in this great move of God. How many of you have been, how many years have you been in this renewal? 35. Over 35. How about you? 75. That's a long time ago. How many years? 35, 40 years. Anybody else been around a long time? 77. 78. 85. What? 79. Wow. With Hispanics, yes. And it's really booming in the Hispanic world. Mexico, all over Latin America. In the U.S., Hispanic churches are very charismatic, as I've seen and looked at 
TV and videos. Uh, it's really spread strong among Hispanics in this country and, and all over the world where people speak Spanish. They call Espanol as la, la lengua de cielo, hermana. Spanish is a language of heaven, they say. Um, okay. Um, just a little bit more. Uh, some recent revivals. I uh, won't go into this. Laughing Revival, remember that? Rodney Howard Brown, that swept across the country. Uh, then you had Toronto Blessing, 1994. John Arnott, Pensacola Revival, Brownsville, and um, Steve Hill. So um, um, it seems that the Spirit just comes in waves, one wave after another. And I want to tell you this, when will this revival stop? When Jesus comes. Now, when we meet together in the air, we are going to be in one church, that's for sure. We won't be divided at all. But in the meantime, let's love one another. Let's uh, pray for the outpouring of the Spirit in all the earth, and especially the Catholic Church, over one billion souls with this charismatic Pope we'll see a, even a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Is that all right to pray yeah. for that? Amen. Let's just lift your hands. Stand. And then I'm going to have questions. Um, I'm going to just show you some pictures real quick as I end. That's Anglican bishops dancing before the Lord in Canterbury Cathedral. I was there. They gave messages in tongues, interpretations from the high altar. And uh, it was just a thing to see 32 bishops of the Anglican Church dancing in the spirit on the high altar of Canterbury Cathedral. So the Lord hit the Anglican Church real hard in those days. And we have a convergence movement. I could go on. T.D. Jakes uh, has one of the largest churches. And the charismatic movement has hit the black church tremendously. Hardly any black church is left in this country that's not charismatic in one way or another. And the great big ones, the huge ones, are charismatic. Um, 